Good morning. It's it's a it's an honor to be here. It's an honor to get to speak to you guys. And I appreciate the opportunity from Pastor Fernando and I appreciate your attention. And I just want to commend all of you for coming out. What does it say? It says, uh, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. So bless you, bless you for making the effort and for coming out. In Jesus' name, let's pray. Father God, I thank you that you are the judge. God, you are our defender, our avenger, if you will. God, you are our coach and you are our father and our shepherd. And I just pray that we would experience you or know you in all these ways, Lord God, in all these ways as, as the things of life come at us, God, let us know how good you are in Jesus' name. Amen. Those of you who were here for the matinee performance will already know the punchline of this joke, so laugh politely anyway. Okay, once upon a time, there was a couple who had a beautiful home. They were retirees and they had moved out. They bought a home on, with wooded acreage, you know, home in the country with trees and just, you know, their country escape. And the wife, the woman, she, she loved to garden and she made the landscaping there beautiful. She planted lots of beautiful flowers and shrubs and, and just tr really spent a lot of time and effort and money to try to make the yard look, look wonderful. There was one problem, though, out here living in the woods. Problem was, well, one day she looked out her window and she saw deer and she's like, honey, we have deer. It's, look, it's deer. They're so cute. They're so beautiful. But after a while, she began to think that they weren't so beautiful because the deer began eating her flowers. Okay. So actually, I have a friend who went through this like very same scenario. So anyway, they tried to build a fence. They built a fence to try to keep the deer out, but it didn't work. And they tried chemical sprays that were like deer repellent sprays, and that didn't work. The deers just kept eating the flowers. And they tried, have you ever heard, if you take human hair and put it out, it'll, uh, it, I saw that in a movie one time, it'll repel the deer. Well, anyway, that didn't work. The deer kept eating her flowers. She was pretty upset about all this, didn't know what she was going to do. Well, her husband watched and saw what was going on. And one day he comes in, he says, honey, I have dealt with the deer problem definitively. And she's like, Really? She said, how? He said, you will know tonight at dinner. Their problem became food for them, and I'm going to come back to that in a little while, and you'll see how that plays into the sermon. But listen, today I want to talk to you about trials and tribulations, suffering, hard times. You know, it'd be nice if I could tell you that once you meet Jesus, there are no more hard times. But that's not just the case. In fact, Jesus promised us, basically, in John 16, 33, he said, in the world, you will have trouble. In the world, you will have trouble. But then he went on and said something like, he said, take heart. I am victorious over the world. I've been, I have the victory over the world. And do you know what? Jesus wants to share that victory with us. So there are two parts of this message. In the first part, I want to talk to you about trials that you're in now or trials that you may face in the future, how you can gain from these, how these are things, they don't have to just be hard things that you merely endure, but these can be profitable times and you come out on the other side stronger and wiser and better off. But I know also that there have probably been battles or situations in your life where you felt like, I did not win. I did not pass the test. I was a victim of injustice. And things happened to me that were not in line with what I saw in the word or the prophecies that had been spoken over me. And today I want to tell you that God is a God of consolation and of recompense. He has so much goodness. He knows how to make up for all the bad stuff that has happened to you. Either way, trials in the past, trials in the future, trials right now, the Lord gives us his peace and causes us to be victorious. You know, when I was a kid, I played a lot of video games. I think they were basically coming on the scene around the same time I came on the scene. And so uh, I played, anyway, the graphics weren't real good on the Atari, but I'd play my older brother's video games. 
And then growing up, I played them. I remember when Super Mario Brothers came out. And yesterday, my son had a Super Mario Brother birthday party. Anyway, and so now I don't play them so much anymore because, you know, I don't have a lot of time as an adult. And uh, I'm sorry, there are adults who play video games. If that's important to you, God bless you. <laughs> I'm saying it's not my priority. But my son, Isaac, he's like, play with me, play with me. And so he wants to go play video games. Now, one thing then as now in video games that you'll see sometimes is that the character uh, goes on a journey, on a quest, and as he, as he goes along this quest, he grows. He gets more powerful. He gets more health points. It, like, when the character starts out, he may have a wooden sword. And to beat a weak enemy, he has to whack it several times. But later on, he graduates and he gets a more powerful sword. He gets more health units. Now he can withstand more hits from a bad guy. Now he has, anyway, he's a more formidable foe to all these enemies. And whenever your character hits this, a point where he uh, gets more power or more health or whatever, it's called leveling up. Hence the title of the sermon, Level Up, Level Up. So let me uh, tell you, I know, I know how this works, partly because I saw it when I was a kid playing games, but I know that I can go, one time this actually happened, I went and pl to play video games with Isaac, and you have to, you choose a character that has a profile and a history, and it depends on how much somebody has played on this profile. So Isaac gets his sister's profile, and his sister's, uh, Anne-Marie's little character has XP, experience points. The XP level is like 69 okay, or 70 or something like that. A lot of experience points. And so when, when Isaac's little character takes its sword and hits a bad guy, he can knock it out in like one hit. I get stuck with some other profile and the XP level is like nine, okay? And so I can take that same bad guy, my character, and I go whack, 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 and eventually the, eventually the thing dies. But the difference is the experience level. The difference is the skill and the strength and the power that they've acquired over their journey, over hours, in this case, of playing. And one stroke of the other, of like Isaac's character's sword, does 10 times the damage that my little sword does. And it's all about experience. It's all about history. Now, if video games are like this, it's not because... Let me get this right. It's not because life imitates art. It's because it's how it is in real life. You know, as you grow, you get better. As you grow, you level up. One quick other example. Say, say a kid gets a, a guitar for Christmas. It's a great value guitar that his parents bought at Walmart. And the kid plays it and learns how to play guitar and really likes it. Well, after a while, maybe on another birthday, the kid gets a nice Yamaha or Epiphone guitar. And he plays that and he sticks with that and he gets really serious about it. And eventually he's able to get a Martin D35. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Britt. You level up. It is life. You go, you learn, you grow. And you, you get more wisdom. You get more resilience. You get more perspective because we level up. And so my whole point here is to reaffirm that in our walk with the Lord, he intended us to level up. He in intended for our character to mature. He, ended to, for, he intended for our faith to grow and for our knowledge of the word and of his ways to get deeper and deeper. And this happens as we have more and more experience with him. We level up. Let's look, if you want to look at a scripture today, look at Romans 5, verses 3 and 4. Romans 5, 3 and 4. This is what it says. We also glory in difficulties or tribulations, trials, knowing that difficulty produces endurance and endurance produces experience and experiences, experience produces hope. Now, I got to say this. The New Testament is written in Greek and sometimes it's tricky translating for the, your Bible translators or anyone studying it. It's, it's difficult to capture the meaning of the Greek word in one English word. But, you know, we try. We try to get it right. So depending on what version you're reading, it may, your version may say something more like that endurance produces character and character produces hope. So, you know, I've, I've, I've gone with what the King James says. It says 
experience. So what's, what's the difference? Well, let me tell you what I think. That word, the word in the Greek is dokime, if that means anything to you. And what it speaks of is something being tested and coming through the test on the other side with its worth or value proven. So for example, if I go to battle with, a, with my trusty sword and the sword serves me well after the battle, the value of the sword is proven, okay? Because it's been through a test. And so you might have read this or I might have read this verse in the past and it says, what is it? Difficult, difficulty produces endurance. Endurance produces character and character produces hope. And I'm like, well, I don't understand how my character gives me more hope. Am I putting my faith in myself? Anyway, but then if you look at it and think of it like this, if you will, when you go through hard times, it, it demands that you have endurance. You have to stick it out. You have to keep believing. You have to keep walking, keep fighting. So that's endurance. But then once you endure, the Lord comes through and you have an experience. And once you have an experience of God coming through once in your life, you have more hope and more faith that he will come through again in the future. So this is how I see it. Yes, the hard times come and we have to persevere. But once you beat it, once you overcome, you know what you have? A testimony. And it wasn't just your character that was proven, because your character does get tested. It was the character of God that was proven, and he came through as faithful. And you realize the value of his friendship, the friendship you have with him, and that produces hope. Listen, imagine this. Imagine this little scenario. Imagine you're the ruler or king of a city, a fortified city long ago, and you govern your people in your little city-state. But then you get news or you see on the horizon there's a foreign army. The foreign hordes are coming to attack your city. And you have to send out the army to oppose them, to fight them off. Now you have three choices. Who are you going to send out? For one, you can send out the elite legion. These are trained, highly trained, battle-hardened men. They've seen action at home and abroad. They know all the tricks. They're highly skilled. Or B, you can send out the casualty corps. This is basically the hospital guy, the, the soldiers in the hospital. They've been in battles. They lost. They're missing limbs or they have psychological trauma, problems they haven't really recovered from. Or the third choice, you can send out the rookie brigade, the rookie brigade. These are all new recruits. They're about 16, 17 years old, although their leader is 20. And uh, they're highly skilled at fighting wooden dummies in the practice field. And also, they like to take a nap every morning after their mommy brings them a snack after the training session. So, who are you going to send out? You're going to send out the elite legion. Okay, you're not going to send out the rookies. You're not going to send out the hospital casualty patients. You're going to send out the best. Here's the question. How did those soldiers get so good at fighting battles? They fought a lot of battles. They may have seen some wins and some losses. They may have gone through some hard times. But you know what? They stuck with it. And by reason of experience and doing it over and over, they got better and better and better until they became elite fighting machines. Listen, it's the same principle, I believe, in the spiritual realm. If you want to get good at overcoming, practice overcoming. He said we're more than conquerors, okay? But I believe it takes practice to, to really figure that out. This is why we have heroes of the faith. This is why sometimes we go to old people, Pray for me. You know, if you go to sea with a captain who's been sailing a long time and a little storm blows up, the boat starts rocking, you might get nervous. The captain doesn't get nervous. You know why? Because he's seen worse and come through the other side. There's something about experience. You know, David, little teenage shepherd boy, he went up and he killed a giant. It's like, wow, amazing. David, the shepherd boy, killed a giant. But what did he tell Saul before that? He said, while I was watching my father's sheep, I had to kill a lion and a bear. 
The lion, the fight with the lion and the fight with the bear helped prepare him for his fight with the giant. Guys, it is through trials and overcoming that we learn to overcome and that we grow, that we learn and we gain. Another guy who had experience fighting and leading the army, this is, this is Joshua in the Old Testament. You know, he served under Moses. And after he had led Israel's army long enough and Moses passed away, Joshua became the leader of Israel. He had that experience. But even way back before that, it, towards the beginning, we see he had a valiant heart. Because at one point, Moses sends out 12 spies to go into the promised land and check it out. See, see what the people are like, see what the land is like. And the 12 spies come back and they're like, oh man, the land is great. But 10 of the spies said, there's no way we'll ever live there because the people in it will, will they'll like eat us for lunch. They'll, they'll, they're like giants. There are these giants there and we will never be able to take it. And they spread discouragement through the camp. But there were two guys, there was Caleb and there was Joshua. They had a different spirit. And they said, or more specifically, Joshua said, famous words. Joshua, when, when asked about could they take the land, he said, they are our bread. They are our bread. Like, we will eat them for lunch. These guys, that's what football teams, that's what they say. We're going to eat you for lunch. That was Joshua's attitude. That was not the attitude of a victim. That was an attitude of an overcomer. When ancient armies would go to war, of course, they were after a military objective. Maybe it was defense, defending their homeland. Maybe it was offense. They were trying to conquer new territory or something. But in any case, they have this objective, but they also had something else in mind. It's not real popular today. I think it's actually against the military code today. But it was the spoils of war. And what this meant was that after you beat a foreign army, especially foreign invaders, you got, to get, you got to go out and take all their stuff. The stuff that they left behind as they fled the battlefield or if they, if they died in battle, you got to take that stuff. And they, a soldier, I believe, knew that if we win this thing, not only, not only do we get our military objective, but also, I get to go out and I get to benefit. I get to gain something. I get to, to take the stuff that the enemy had and I get to have it for myself. I believe that when you're in battle, if you focus on the agony and the heat and the exhaustion and the sacrifice, that is not a winning attitude. But if you will stay focused on the joy that is set before you, if you'll stay focused on the victory and on the spoils and what there is to be gained, it will help carry you through all the way to victory. Like Jesus, it said, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Hallelujah. Here's another little story. Story. There's a pioneer. Pioneer lives near the Rockies, on the edge of the Rockies in the early 1800s, maybe up towards Canada, before anything was a state even, up there. And he has his little wife, and, and they have a little baby. She just had a baby. They have this log cabin out there near the mountains. And the pioneer knows that winter is coming. It's fall now, and winter is coming and so he works hard trying to get ready for the winter. He wants them to, to stay warm in the snow and everything that's going to happen until the spring thaw. And so he gets his log cabin ready. He tries to make it airtight so there's no drafts. And he goes out and he cuts firewood and he's working hard. He's cutting firewood so they'll be able to keep warm. And as he's out there and also his wife's out there, you know, outside with him, what does he see coming up? But he sees a big old nine foot grizzly bear come in his way. Actually, it's not coming his way. It's coming, and the grizzly bear is headed for his wife and child. So what does he do? He takes his muzzle loader rifle, which he always keeps with him and always keeps it loaded, and he takes that gun, and he aims it at the bear. He fires, and he shoots that bear right between the eyes, and it falls over dead. I want to ask you, how did they keep warm that winter? What kind of coat were they wearing? They're wearing bear coat, bear coat. Thank you, bear fur. Listen, you don't normally, people don't normally go looking for trouble. You don't go looking for bears to mess with because bear can mess you up pretty bad, okay? 
But if that bear represents provision, if that bear represents warmth in the winter, if that bear represents taking care of your family, a man will go out and he will face that bear or that mountain lion or whatever it is because he has a different attitude about it. He's not thinking about the teeth. He's thinking about the fur. This is what I want us to do. If we could learn to do this, I'm not saying I've mastered it. When we go through a trial, we see a hard time coming and we're in the middle of it. If we can say, Lord, what can I profit from this tribulation? Lord, this hard time that I'm going through, what am I going to gain? Because you're a good God. This is a battle and you've called me an overcomer. So what is my objective? Lord, what is my strategy for winning? And God, what are the spoils to be had at the end? It's a different attitude. It's good to survive. But if all we do is endure and survive, I don't think that's all that Jesus died for. Because he said, you are more than conquerors. I don't want to tell you, in my own life, there have been times that I wake up at night, lying in bed, and I wake up and I feel fear. You just get creeped out, you know, whatever, maybe you had a bad dream. And, and I wake up and I feel this fear. And, and, and so what I like to do, what I've learned to do, is I get up and I go in the living room and I sit down on the sofa and I grab my electric guitar and I don't plug it in, okay? Electrics, whenever played without being plugged in, are very quiet. And I take that guitar and I begin to worship the Lord. I play worship songs. And do you know what happens? As I worship the Lord, the com- it's like the comfort of the Lord comes and the fear goes away. 3.30 in the morning, I'm in there playing worship songs on my guitar real quietly. I trust my wife can't hear it, not, don't want to disturb her. And it seems to me I could do that on a regular night, and often I do, you know, get up and just play, try to worship, and it's, it's fine. It can be good, but the sweetest night of, the, of, of worship to the Lord is when the fear came in the strongest. When the fear pressed the hardest, that's when the Lord pressed back even harder. And I gain, I have gained a deeper, a deeper knowledge of the Lord, just a little bit deeper closeness to the Lord because of this experience of fighting this one little battle and learning how to win. You know, years ago, uh, Graham Cook came and stood in this pulpit and he preached a sermon. I don't think I'll ever forget. He talked about vengeance. Now, vengeance, vengeance normally is you hit me, I hit you back. You do something bad to me, I do something bad, to, bad back. Well, that's not a Christian value. But when you take it to the spiritual level, it becomes very much a kingdom value. Because the Lord, the Bible talks about the year of vengeance, right? The vengeance of our God. And so what, how Graham explained it was, whenever you overcome a problem, you receive an anointing to minister to people in the same thing you overcame. For example, if you were addicted to drugs and alcohol, once Jesus sets you free, you were empowered to go help others get free from drugs and alcohol. And that is vengeance upon the enemy who tried to destroy you with it. If you are sick, you had cancer or some other disease, you get healed, you are now anointed and empowered to go minister to others. You have the empathy, you have the love, and you have power to go pray for them to be healed just like you were healed. And that is vengeance from the Lord. Do you know what? It's great to know truth and to have ideas and opinions and theories about the word. And those things can be essential. But when you have an experience... When you have a testimony, that's a whole nother level. It's not, it's not, well, I think God can heal you. It's, no, I have experienced the Lord healing me. And what he has done before, he is able to do again. One more scripture, one more bit of Greek. Hebrews 12, 7. You don't have to turn there if you don't want. But the Greek text of Hebrews 12, 7 starts out with three words in Greek, four words in English. It says something like this. Endure like it's discipline. Endure like it's discipline. It's one way of wording it, one way of translating it. Now, like I said, Greek words can be hard to nail down 
accurately or correctly, but one possibility is discipline. The problem is when you render it that way is when I think of discipline in the context of a father and a son, discipline involves a belt and a behind, okay? Son, come here, I'm gonna discipline you. Let's talk about how we discipline our children. Okay, we're talking about painful correction, punishment. And if you believe that, then you'll go through a hard time and you'll think, well, the Lord is correcting me painfully. He is spanking my behind and I've just got to learn from this. Okay, which I'm not saying there's no validity to that, but here's another way to think about it. Another way to translate that word that's translated discipline is training, training. So how about this? Endure like it's training, Training, you have something to gain. Here's, here's, here's another made up story. You work at a computer company. You're a, a code monkey. You know, you code. Anybody do IT code stuff in here? No one? My wife is in IT, but anyway. She did. Anyway, imagine with me. One day you're at work and your, your boss says, Smith, or whatever your name is, we're going to send you to Cincinnati, Ohio for six weeks for you're going to learn how to code in this, this other computer language called Python. Okay, Python is actually a computer language. We're gonna send you to Cincinnati for six weeks. You're gonna learn how to code Python. Well, you know that employee can have two different responses. On the one hand, the employee can go, Ugh, Cincinnati. Like, what is there even in Ohio? Like, I've been to college. I don't like taking tests. I don't like going to classes. I don't want to do this. Look, I'm going to be gone for six weeks. Who's going to take care of my dog? I don't know anybody up there. What am I going to do up there? Stay at a hotel at night and watch TV? You know, like, why do I have to do this? How come Johnson didn't get sent? How come, how come you know, uh, Mr. Simmons didn't get sent? Why do I have to go? But there's another attitude that he could have when faced with the prospect of training. This is what he could say. He could say, you know what? I'm about to go, on this, go take this course and I'm gonna learn how to code Python. And when I do, I'm gonna be a more marketable employee and I'm gonna have another reason to ask my boss for a raise. And when I go up there, I'm gonna go sightsee and I'm gonna see a new part of the United States that I've never discovered before. And when I get up there, I'm gonna have other people in this class and I'm gonna make new friends and it may even be my new best friend is sitting in that class. This training class, this honor that has been accorded to me is going to be good. So when you think about that scripture, Hebrews 12, 7, endure like it's training. What is our attitude? Yes, sir, Lord, I am ready to learn. I'm ready to grow. I am ready to level up. That was the, the first part where I want to talk about how you approach your trials, but the, the trials that are coming, the trials that you're in now. But what about the trials in the past? What about the things you went through and you felt like you didn't pass the test? What about the things you went through and you felt like I was a victim of injustice? Something bad happened to me. And even though maybe I cried out to the Lord or maybe I felt like I had a prophetic promise or I had a scripture to stand on, everything still feels like it ended up badly. But I want to tell you today that God is the God of consolation. And he is a God. He has so much goodness that he can, as it were, pay you back for the things that you've suffered unjustly. See, there is a court in heaven and the judge is waiting to hear your case. I'm not talking about frivolous cases based on fraud and entitlement where you get millions of dollars because you drank hot coffee out of a drive through I'm talking about where you have suffered wrong. Listen, I have, to, I have to disclaim this. We all deserve death and hell. It is all by the grace and the goodness of God. Okay, so this is not about entitlement or what God owes us, but he has promised us in his goodness. It says what? It says, how great is the goodness you have stored up for those who fear you. And he is the just judge that when we cry out to him, he is able 
to compensate us, if you will. He is able to take all the badness, the hole that the badness left, and fill it back up, and then some, with his goodness. We just, what we have to do is learn how to make the claim. We have to learn how to plead that case before the, the court of heaven. Scripturally, give you three examples of people where this, this basically happened. So the first, the most famous, I have to mention, is Job. Job was a very rich man, and rich back then really meant livestock. He had camels and donkeys and, and sheep or whatever else he had, very rich. And he had seven children, and he had this great life. And one day, somehow, I don't understand it all, the Lord brags on Job to Satan. Hey, Satan, see Job? He's pretty awesome, huh? Of all the people on, the Lord, on earth, he picked Job. And, and Satan said, well, you know what? If you, if you take away what he has or if you mess with him, lift that blessing, he's going to curse you. And God, for whatever reason, I don't understand why, God said, okay, you can do it. Just spare his life, but you can do it. So what happens? Job, short story, he, he, he loses all his wealth. His children are all killed. And even his own body is afflicted with like illness, with sores or, or whatever it was. Job has gone from riding very high to being very low. But even though he lost all his wealth and lost his children and lost his health, he didn't lose his faith in the Lord. And he said, the Lord, has, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. His wife said, curse God and die. I'm sure she was bitter. She lost her children. But he would not let go of his faith in the Lord. And through this process, and you can read the book of Job, through this process, he ends up having an experience, an encounter with the Lord. And he, he said, what, that, that before I had heard of you, but now I have seen you face to face. And at the end of the story, the Lord restores back to Job double the wealth. The Lord gives, the, gives Job seven new kids, a new family, if, you, if it will, and I believe he restored him to health also. And it's become this famous picture of enduring under, in the face of suffering and not losing your faith in the Lord and what he does to compensate, giving you double for your trouble. Another obvious story is Jesus. Do you know when you talk about unjust treatment, unjust punishment, Jesus is the Prime example, history's prime example. This is a man who walked sinlessly, fulfilled the law of Moses, and was crucified. He was scourged, he was mocked, he was beaten, crucified as a criminal. This was not just punishment. What did the Lord do as, as consolation, as, as compensation to the Lord? This is what it says in Philippians 2, 7 through 9. Talking about Jesus, it says, But he emptied himself, having taken the form of a servant. Being born in the likeness of a man and being found in the form of a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, death on a cross. Therefore, God highly exalted him and bestowed upon him the name above every name. Jesus was willing to endure the unthinkable and then he was exalted to the highest place by the Lord. Because God is a God of justice, and he's a God of recompense, and he's a God of consolation. So we talk about Job, we talk about Jesus. You can't really outdo those two, but there's still one other story I want to try to, try to tell you about. You may, have, you may have a different opinion, but please appreciate, just listen to the, the way I'm going to present it and see what you think. There's another person in the Bible that suffered great injustice, but the Lord in the end paid them back for what they had gone through. The person that I want to talk to you about is Bathsheba. Here's the way I see the story. King David is king in Israel. He's not the young shepherd boy anymore. He's well established over the United Kingdom, Israel and Judah. And at this point, he sent the army off. The army has gone off to fight a war. Okay, so King David is back. He's chilling at the palace. And one night, while his army is out fighting, David is out on the roof and he's taking a walk on his palace. Taking a walk on the roof out there. And somehow, you know, he looks over the, the houses and the city and whatever else he sees. But he happens to see a woman who is bathing. Okay, and the woman, of course, is Bathsheba. Now, bathing is a very mundane, normal thing to do. And I assume that Bathsheba was, 
just innocently, like for all I know, she was behind walls that to see over the walls, you'd have to like be in a castle or something. So anyway, David sees her and unlike I would tell teenagers to do these days, when something like that happens, look the other way, focus on something else, divert your eyes and your thoughts. But David, for whatever reason, doesn't do this. David decides to inquire, who is, hey, uh, excuse me, servant, uh, just out of pure curiosity, who is the woman that lives at 123, you know, whatever street down in Jerusalem? And they said, well, that's, that's Bathsheba, and her husband is Uriah the Hittite, and, uh, and he's off at war. That was, I didn't mention that. You probably know, but Bathsheba was married to a man, Uriah. He was a faithful patriot. He was a devoted soldier. As far as we know, they didn't have any children. Maybe they hadn't been married very long. Maybe they had infertility issues. I don't know. But anyway, he has been sent off to war with David's armies. So she's at home alone and she's doing her thing. And so David sees her bathing and, and he, uh, he inquires about her and then he sends for her. So imagine this. Bathsheba is at home. You know, maybe it's the next day. I don't know. She's doing her thing. Knock on the door. Well, who is it? That's weird. Who's that? It's royal messengers. And she's like, royal messengers? What on earth is going on? Is there something wrong with my husband? Okay, what, what's going on? And they're like, your, your presence was requested before the king. And she's like, the king wants to see me? What is up? So she, maybe she tries to fix herself up or, you know, put something nice on. And she goes with the messengers to see the king. And when she goes into the palace, when she goes into the palace, she meets the man, the myth, the legend. King David, the anointed, God's chosen man who overcame Goliath and united the kingdoms and leads Israel. And she's probably in awe of what she sees. And it's like, to what do I owe the honor of this invitation, O king? And then I don't know how it went down. We're speculating here. Maybe the king sends the servants and the guards away. And the king starts making inappropriate advances. And she's like, what the heck is going on? And then this great honor, this amazing moment becomes a nightmare as he basically overpowers her. Remember the status of women was not what it was today. As he basically overpowers her in the way I read it, he rapes her. And afterwards she is sent back home. Well, a month or so passes, I'm thinking, and she realizes that she is pregnant. David, so she sends news. She probably had to put it in code somehow, some coded message. Sends a message to the king to tell, her, tell him that she's pregnant. And then the king's like, oh man, this is a problem. Because you know what? By law, like according to Deuteronomy, they're both liable to death. They can, be, they can both be killed, okay? They deserve death according to the law. So David's like, well, I have a problem. I've got to cover this up. So how does he cover this up? Ah, he has an idea. He sends for Uriah, the devoted faithful soldier, to be brought home from the field on furlough. And he says, this is what's going to happen. I'm going to talk to Uriah, and then I'm going to say, Uriah, go home and be with your wife. And then after he's been with his wife, I have plausible deniability. So this is his plan. No problem. Cover up. It'll all be fine. David has Uriah come and he talks to him and stuff. And then Uriah says, I will not go home to my wife so long as the ark and the men of Israel are out in the field. So Uriah sleeps on the steps of the palace. And David's like, well, this didn't work like I had planned. So the next night, David says, hey, come eat. And he gives him so much food and wine that Uriah gets drunk. And David's like, now he'll go home. Now he'll go home. But no, Uriah stumbles, drunk. He stumbles out of the feasting hall and goes and sleeps with the servants at the gate of the, or the door of the, the, the castle, the palace. David's like, this is not good. So this is what David decides to do next. He learned this one from his spiritual father, Saul, by the way. You, this is another story. He writes a note to Joab, the army commander, says, put Uriah on the front line so he's killed in battle. Seals it up, gives it to Uriah, says, here, don't look at this. Take this to Joab. It's a, it's a sordid story, let me tell you. Uriah, yes, sir, I faithfully serve you and the nation of Israel. So he goes off, 
Joab reads it, puts him on the front lines, and Uriah is killed by the enemy that they're fighting. Bathsheba learns the news that her husband is dead, and the Bible says that she mourned. She grieved. I believe that she truly loved the man. She grieved for her husband. And then what surely must have looked like an act of great mercy and kindness, King David marries. He extends his protection and wealth to this poor widow woman. She's the widow of a veteran. Can you imagine how good that looks to, you know, from a political point of view? And so Bathsheba comes and becomes his wife. So now when she has this baby, it's all going to look good. Like no question. Even if the baby looks like David, no problem. And so everything is great as far as, far as this cover-up goes, except for the prophet Nathan. The Lord shows him what's going on. And Nathan goes, it's an awesome story. You should read it. He confronts David and David realizes I have really screwed up. And so David repents and Nathan says like, even though you deserve to die, you're not going to die. But that doesn't mean there are going to be no consequences. Actually, what's going to happen is the child that, that Bathsheba has born to you is not going to live. So what happens, even though David pleads with the Lord, the baby, his child with Bathsheba, the baby passes away. Think about Bathsheba's situation at this point. Bathsheba is a rape victim. Bathsheba is a widow. She was a widow. She lost her husband, her first husband. And now Bathsheba is a grieving mother. Bathsheba has received a raw deal. She did not know, as far as I can read in the scripture, she did not do anything to deserve this. But here she is. She lives in the palace, but would she have traded the life of her husband and the life of her child for that privilege? I don't think so. But you know what? God is a God of consolation and recompense. What was the consolation and the recompense that God gave Bathsheba for what she had suffered unjustly? I believe that his name was Solomon. Bathsheba's next child with David, says David comforted his wife. Bathsheba's next son, the prophet said, name him Jedidiah, loved of the Lord, but also like his that was his middle name, I don't know. He had another name, it was Solomon, man of peace. And that word peace, there's an echo, there's another word in Hebrew, a verb, shalom, and it speaks of repaying and making restitution. And even though Solomon was the king of peace, he had peace in the land during his days. I wonder if there wasn't something in there for Bathsheba. Bathsheba, this son is your restitution. Because you know what? It doesn't say it in the Bible that she cried out, but I can only imagine that she cried out to the Lord. Lord, why has all this happened to me? And help, help me, Lord. What are you going to do about it? And the Lord gave her a son who would become the greatest, the wisest, the richest king that Israel had ever seen. I believe it was consolation. It was compensation. Now, I think it's worth pointing out, at the last minute when David was on his deathbed, he had another son who tried, a usurper, if you will, who tried to, it was uh, Adonijah. Adonijah had a party and basically proclaimed himself as king. And Nathan said, Bathsheba, you better get in there and talk to your husband if you're going to live. So the prophet and, and the king's bride went in and pled their case before the king. And they said, is this is Adonijah, is this person the one you want to be king or is it Solomon? And the king heard their pleas and the king said, Solomon, my son, is going to be king. And when they anointed him king, they said the party was so loud that the earth split because of the music, the shouting, the songs. She almost lost that consolation, but she, she got in there and interceded and there it was, the Lord came through. So that, that's, that's pretty much it. I want to wrap up. The musicians, if you guys would like to come out, you're welcome to. But listen, today, what, what I want to say is 
on the one hand, if there are trials you're going through or you face in the future, I want you to know that there are spoils to be had. There are lessons to be learned. There is a depth of a relationship with the Lord to be gained through the hard things you go through. When you see God come through again and again and again, you will have a testimony and you will know him like never before. And you can tell others, my faith is not just based on intellectual facts and reasoning. My faith is also based on supernatural experience. But also, if you have been a victim of injustice, if there was a prophetic word or a scriptural promise that you felt like God didn't come through on, if bad things happened, you went through trials and you lost, let me tell you, the Lord has goodness that is so great that is stored up for you. The Lord is able, the Lord is able to pay you back double for your trouble. It's not because you deserve it. It's not because he owes it to you. It is because he is good. Would you stand up with me, please? Moses, possibly the, the greatest prophet who ever lived aside from God, uh, from Jesus. Moses, who spoke with God face to face. This is what Moses prayed in Psalm 90. Satisfy us in the morning with your love and let us sing for joy and rejoice all our days. Cause us to rejoice according to the days you have afflicted us to the years we have seen evil. Okay, listen to that. He says, cause us to rejoice in measure, in accordance with this, the days and the years that we've seen evil, that we've had bad things happen. Lord, if we've gone through a year, a bad year, God, give us a good year. God, if we've had a bad day or a bad week, give us a good day or a good week. Lord, cause us to rejoice to the full measure of, of how we have wept and how we have suffered. And scripturally, I believe we can say that God will go beyond and he'll do double. He'll do double for the trouble that you've seen if you will trust in him and believe with him. So would you just repeat this after me? Say, cause us to rejoice according to the days you have afflicted us to the years we have seen evil. And in Jesus' name, I say, body of Christ, church, encourage your church, may you level up. May you go to the next level. You are more than conquerors. You are not losers. You are not orphans. You are not left behind. But you have a good, good father. I encourage you, plead your case. Go before the judge and plead your case and see what he will not do. In Jesus' name, God bless you. Thank you for listening. To